pray with me a moment. Holy God, help us to see what you want us to see and to hear what we need to hear so that even now, even to others, a source of hope, a source of comfort, a source of joy, make it so by the power of your Holy Spirit and the people were heard to say, Amen. So this is the last sermon piece. Isn't that a great picture, by the way? Beth Astarte gets credit for that picture. We have, um, as usual, we have plenty of room down in the front rows, Tim and Emma, or there might be some room <laughs> elsewhere. Maybe, maybe, if, maybe if Jim and Joe Lynch scooted in a little bit. See, now, now Bob, Bob Quinn's got the same dilemma. There's a couple of spots right here, Bob. <laughs> it's nice to see you this morning. <laughs> Isn't joy, what, how about savoring, savoring the gifts of humor? That's one of the wonderful things of, of humor. Not at someone's expense. We love you, Tim and Emma. We love you, Bob. Wherever you found your place. Where'd you go, Bob? Okay. Right on. And so, I've been preaching um, during the season of Epiphany on the passion of Jesus, the human side of Jesus. And the basis of this has been a book by Peter Wallace. And we've used resource materials from um, Marsha McPhee's Worship Design Studio. And uh, so this is the last week. As you know, if you've been here, we've been looking at the various emotions that we all feel and experience. Um, and the whole point of this has been so that we might be more authentic. By following Jesus' model of being clear, being direct, being honest about what's going on for us emotionally without doing it to manipulate or to put somebody else in a different awkward position, but simply to be direct and to help those feelings and emotions propel our purpose in life. And so there is a, a one at the heart of our Christian faith is the proclamation that Jesus is fully human and fully divine, which by the way, is why we have two candles lit every week on our table. One is for the humanity of Christ and the other is for the divinity of Christ. So that's a little trivia. If you get a chance to be a confirmation mentor sometime, you can trot that out and see, see if the young people know that. And so Epiphany is means aha, getting it. Getting it that that baby who was born in a manger grew up to be an adult. He was a social and religious reformer. He was a prophet. He was a teacher. He was a healer. He changed the world. And I don't know about you, but when I went to Sunday school, Jesus was sort of meek and mild and gentle and didn't upset anybody. Well, that isn't really the Jesus that we read about in the Gospels. Jesus is much more than that. Provocateur. One who was willing to put himself out there at risk in order to make clear the love of God for all people. So, we're going to talk about joy today. And I, before I even show you what the Merriam-Webster, actually it's funny, I, when I put this up here this morning, I was proofing it and I had misspelled Miriam. And I had almost left it there to see if anybody would say, Guess what? You misspelled the name of the dictionary. <laughs> that would have been a risk, wouldn't it? That would have been a bit provocative, but I, I, I wimped out. So think for a minute about what joy means to you. And so here's what Miriam says. The emotion of both by well-being, success, or good fortune, by the prospect of possessing what one desires or delight. The expression or exhibit of such emotion, gaiety. A state of happiness or felicity, bliss. Does that seem to fit? But wait, there's more. 
There was a big game recently. Here's an example of what the English word joy means. Absolutely, just thrilled in the moment. My team won. We haven't won for generations. We know what that's like, don't we? To be overwhelmed with, with, with something happening that we really have wanted to happen for a long time. And we can just feel that overwhelming flood of, of goodness and happiness. You know, those experiences are really important. They're absolutely essential, especially because life isn't always good, right? So it's important to have your eyes open for joy. But the joy that Jesus lived and what's talked about in the Bible is, is a little bit different than our usual English understanding. So the Greek word is kara, rejoice, be glad. Not really joy is happiness or bliss, but a sense of thanksgiving, a sense of rejoicing, a sense of appreciation. It's a subtle difference, but you may remember that the Merriam-Webster Dictionary first definition was delight in possessing something. Notice that there's nothing about possession here. It's about appreciation, thankfulness, and rejoicing because of that. If there was such a word, it would be rejoicefulness. There isn't, but hey, play with it. You may, you may find that you'll want to coin a new word, and Miriam will thank you for it. So from our call to worship, this is really the joy that that is meant in the Bible and the joy that Jesus lives in. This, of course, is from the Hebrew scriptures, but Jesus, as a good rabbi, would have been fed by those scriptures. So it's making a joyful noise, but notice that there's, there's gladness here, and it's, and it's um, thanksgiving, and there's praise. The Lord is good, love endures forever. There's a way in which the joy is connected, not just with something that we are excited about, but it's joy in being connected with others and with God. That deep sense of joy that can't be taken away. I don't know about you, but happiness comes and goes for me. Ever notice that happiness comes and goes? Joy of this kind also can come and go, but if it's really rooted in a sense that God loves you and all people, it's like an anchor that can help no matter what's going on and whether you're happy or not. So here are some examples of Chara. This is, um, for those of you who are Civil War buffs, um, this is Chamberlain, um, no, not Chamberlain, Ulysses Grant and Robert E. Lee. And my guess is that there was the rejoicing of the kind, the joy of the kind that isn't necessarily happy because thousands of people died from the Civil War, but a sense of thankfulness that it's over. This fellow happens to be from Augusta, Maine, which is the capital of Maine. I probably wouldn't know that if I hadn't grown up in Maine, but um, he is one of the few soldiers that survived D-Day, the taking of Normandy. And if you've ever heard some of these veterans speak, you know that there is a, there is a, a sense of thankfulness and appreciation and rejoicing that they survive. But the happiness piece is somewhat muted because they lost friends and they aren't quite sure why it is that they survived and others did. So my guess is this is the kind of joy that sustains people who have been through that kind of traumatic experience so they can begin to move forward. I'm guessing when the Martin Luther King Jr. monument was placed in Washington, D.C., there was a sense of joy. But I'm guessing there was some of the happiness would have been muted by the fact that it took so long for it to get there. And he was martyred. And we still struggle with civil rights and racism in this country. But there's still thankfulness, appreciation, and rejoicing that that monument is present. Same thing, I think, when marriage equality became real here in Oregon. I'm guessing that there was 
some joy, some rejoicing, some thanks, thankfulness, and I'm guessing there was probably some wonder if it would actually be real. If it would actually happen. Could it be true? But there was rejoicing and a sense of thanksgiving and appreciation. So I have a personal example. When my dad died, I was not happy. I was not jumping up and down. But as I dealt with the grief of my father's death, I moved into a sense of thanksgiving and appreciation and rejoicing that I had known my dad and that even though he was gone physically, there was a way in which he continues to be a guide for me. And for that, I give thanks, I rejoice, and it brings me joy. Can I get a witness on these things? Or am I making any sense whatsoever? Yes. Jesus and joy. Well, you know, at his birth, Gabriel said, Joy! And bring him great news of joy. And with his disciples and sinners, John's disciple, John the Baptist's disciples were big on fasting and being pious and somber and, you know, don't, don't have too much fun in life. Um, you know, some of you know some Baptists that are like that. <laughs> but Jesus' response to them was, well, why wouldn't you celebrate with the bridegroom while the bridegroom's with you? You wouldn't fast at a wedding, would you? That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So let's have fun and enjoy the moment while we have it. Of course, the children, oh, the disciples thought, can't have time for these little ankle biters. You know, they're just kind of in the way most of the time, you know? Shh, be quiet. Jesus, oh man, no way. Come on, kids, come to me. Come to me. And I'm afraid that part of the Protestant Reformation um, stripped some of the Jewishness from Jesus. Because if, if you're familiar at all with Jewish culture, um, there's a kind of playful banter to it. There's a kind of um, in, enjoyment of, of, of making phrases so that you have to pay attention to them and they might have more than one meaning. Now this, um, easier for a a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Now, most of us, well, I, I shouldn't say most. For me as a kid, I heard from the pulpit that that was one of those signs that we really should, you know, that wealth could be a sign of evilness. You know, that, and let's say if you, if you read this passage to a six-year-old, they might laugh out loud because it's so funny to think about a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle, right? It's that kind of humor. It was not meant to be condemnation. Jesus said, I came to redeem the world. And how about in the parables? That the lost coin, the woman was so happy when she found it. The shepherd was so happy when he found the last sheep. And, and by the way, that one sheep was happy that, that someone went to find them. And the prodigal son. Joy that the one who was lost has come back. And, and Jesus was full of joy during the mission about which Nikki read earlier. So in the 10th chapter of Luke, here's the setting. Jesus' ministry is starting to spread like wildfire. So he's got to figure out a way to manage it. One of the ways to manage it is to have people work with you. So he calls 70 of his closest followers and he gave them instructions that they were to go out into the communities out into the villages, countryside cities and, and preach the good news of God's love and do it in Jesus name and heal people, help them, listen to them and if people aren't receptive just, just knock the dust off your shoes, keep going so they came back and they, they couldn't believe it, they said to Jesus hey guess what, it worked I don't know about you, but sometimes success can make my head get a little... And so Jesus encouraged them. 
And he said, you know what? I have given you power to be able to confront the enemy, right? So I think that's anything that's opposed, anything that's opposed to love is the enemy. And we've got lots of that. I said at the beginning of the service, we're sinners. That's because sometimes we don't actually want to embrace love. We'd rather be right. Or oh, we'd rather be um, extra special because maybe we really don't feel extra special. So we act like it and put other people down. With love, especially those people that we call our enemies, those that really push our buttons. But Jesus reminded them my name, and and here's the thing. What's really significant about this, what you should really be rejoicing about, is that God has noticed that, you, that Jesus used the language, your names are written in heaven. I don't really believe that there's a you know a big book up in the sky someplace. I don't believe that. Some people do. But what that phrase tells me is, remember that what you do is connected to God's mission. And that we can be involved. We can be part of what God wants to happen. And the realm is close at hand. And then Jesus was even more joy-filled after the disciples had told him about this. And you can imagine why. He was so gratefully praying to God. And he said, thank you for revealing some of this to the people who never thought they'd see it. The poor. The sick. The imprisoned. The homeless. I, mean, I imagine that's what his face looked like. When he knew, have you ever had that feeling where you've worked on something, you've worked on something, you've worked on something, and finally it starts to happen? Wow. And the last part of the, of the uh, passage is that um, Jesus talks about you have eyes to see what others weren't able to see. And one of the things I think that means is that we can see the contrast and, and witheredness so that we can respond. Blessed are the eyes that what you, the eyes that see what you see. And I like this image because if you think about it, if, if you had a little heart in your uh, pupil, you could be looking out and you'd be seeing with the lenses of love. That might enable you to see how crazy that image is. It's from Thailand. That's the clearest picture I've seen of the inequality of wealth. That's what Jesus is talking about. See as I see. And I see there's something wrong with that. I see that there could be joy for all if there was justice. And then this is actually um, a, a picture of a peace movement that's going on in Palestine. And um, the, the thing about why I lift this up is that if you're anything like I am, there's been so much bitterness and hatred and terrorism and awful treatment between Israelis and Palestinians that you sometimes just shake your head like, it is never going to get any better. And then you see pictures like this of people who actually believe that they can make a difference if they learn by being in relationship with people who live on both sides of the border. I love those pictures. So living the, the joy, the kind of joy that Jesus had means that, you know, we live out our lives with the obligations we have to our career, to our family, to our relationships, to the things that we um, give ourselves to, our service, heartily, heartily. That means you do it with a heart, an open heart, a willing heart, rather than a, oh, geez. And we all have those moments of, oh, do I have to do that? Of course we do. Of course we do. And that moment can pass as quickly as we choose to see joy. Make choices to see 
with irises and with hearts in them, it fulfills our call. God, I believe, calls all of us to do something, to be something. We may not be aware of it, but I think it's, it's there. And this is one of those opportunities to be joyful about it, rather than being like Jonah and running like crazy from the call. <laughs> Can I get a witness on that? Savor what brings us joy in life. I really mean that. Savor it. You know what? Life is short. And there's so much good to be done. There's so much joy to have. I mean, if we focused on what was broken, we'd never smile, crack a smile. Right? <clears throat> Savor with mindfulness of how our joy affects others. Our mindfulness. Because if, if joy is hurting somebody else... It's probably not really genuine joy, is it? You know, I, I've been in situations not unlike the Philadelphia Eagles with fans who are so ecstatic about what's going on, they don't notice that there are some other people who are not very happy with it. And so it's the how do you celebrate? How do you rejoice? How do you have joy? And this is one of my favorite quotes from Henry Nouwen. Joy doesn't simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. So finally, this sermon series was about living on authentically. And Thich Nhat Hanh is a Buddhist monk. And he has this saying that the energy that helps us touch life deeply is known as smirti, the energy of mindfulness. And I think one of the things we do as progressive Christians is we listen to the wisdom of other faith traditions. And this is a great example of it, being mindful, knowing that we're really connected uh, with the energy when we're, when we're mindful of it. We, that's what connects us. And Jesus was full of mindfulness. He knew his emotions. He was transparent with them. He was direct with them. And he let them shape his life. Finally, authentic is living fully human. This, this is a fellow named Walter Wink. And Walter Wink was on the faculty at Union Theological Seminary when I was a student there. And if you had to get, if you didn't sign up for his course the first year you were, the, the first year you were there, you probably wanted, wouldn't, you weren't going to get in because it was so popular. And it was a Bible study, how to make the Bible come alive. And so Walter Wink has made some really interesting theological writings about the ways in which Jesus is referred in the Bible. One of them is son of man. Well, Walter Wink says that means it's like the archetype of being human. The archetype of being fully human. And he wrote Jesus incarnated God in his own person in order to show the rest of us how to incarnate God. To incarnate God is what it means to be fully human. See the difference between worshiping the one and only incarnate and incarnated was to invite me to incarnate God. Not just me, but you. All of you. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. We're free to go on the journey that Jesus has charted rather than to worship the journey of Jesus which makes us co-creators with God. So in some ways, it's easier to think about worshiping just the one incarnate, only Son of God. But I think the more challenging call from God and from Jesus, I have shown you what it means to incarnate God. Now, your turn. And the people were heard to say, 